So um, Daniel, we're actually moving into chapter two now, and I've entitled this, When Faith Meets the Impossible Dream. And this is Nebuchadnezzar's, King Nebuchadnezzar's, first recorded dream here in the book of Daniel. And his dream results in a kind of an existential threat to the lives of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now, this is Alan Iser, a psychologist and a clinical lecturer at the University of Michigan. And I have his, his picture up here, uh, but I don't know him at all. So don't take this as an endorsement of him. It's always a little bit risky when you get into psychology and psychiatry. Uh, to say, I really follow this guy and I like what he has to say. So that's my disclaimer. I'm not endorsing him and I'm not not endorsing him. But he has some interesting things to say about dreams. He says, dreams can be highly meaningful because they deal with the sort of personal conflicts and emotional struggles that people are experiencing in their daily lives. Now, there are certain dreams that are common to all of us. How many of you, how many of you have completed, well, I, you don't have to raise your hand. How many of you com have completed, a, uh, let's say, a, a higher, uh, a, a, decree, a degree in higher education, whether it's a bachelor's or a master's or a doctorate? One of the common dreams that we have is we, we dream about having an exam that's, that's coming up and we don't have enough time to prepare for it because we went through that when we were going, when we, when we were uh, obtaining our degree. So, but we, then we wake up and we realize we still, have, we still have that stress from years ago when we were in college, but at the same time we're relieved until the next time that you have that that nightmare. Now also a common nightmare is being chased. And when you're being chased, you're not able to run at full speed. In fact, sometimes it's slow motion and you feel like something's holding you back. Anybody had that, that one? The sheets in the bed, yeah, that's what's holding you back, right? Yeah, that's probably true. But here are some possible meanings to that. Fear of something that's catching up to you. You know, it, it could be, you know, a lot of things, just, you know, certain responsibilities that you just don't have time for, whether at work or at home or, or whatever it might be. Or it could be a feeling of being overwhelmed that we're behind in just getting things done. And so we, we have these dreams that we're running, but we're not running fast enough. Just some possible meanings here. Now, how many of you have had uh, a nightmare of falling? Not just any falling, but you know, falling from a high place. The, this is uh, <laughs> the, the acrophobia, the fear of heights, yes. Well, most of us, I think, would have a fear of heights if we were in this position. <laughs> it's not so much the fear of the height, but the fear of you know, hitting when you, when you finally reach the bottom. So the nightmare of falling, that's very common and, and possible meanings to that. Maybe it's a sign that you don't feel like you're in control of your life, or maybe you're just afraid to try something new. And I'm not suggesting that you should try this. I would not. I think these people are crazy. <laughs> the what? There's a, you're like 10 feet under or, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> There's also the nightmare of being in public. This is kind of personal, you know, being in public without being fully clothed, you know? And you obviously you're, you're kind of embarrassed about that. I hope you are. So it could be the feeling of not being in control of one's life or being ashamed about something, something else, or a fear of being exposed for something that you're ashamed of. So 
you know, there are, there are various reasons why you might have that dream, but it's a common nightmare. There's also the nightmare of drowning or losing your breath. Some possible meanings to that, overwhelmed by circumstances or unable to express fears and emotions in a healthy way. And so you, you, it, it kind of takes the breath out and it feels like you're suffocating. So that's, an, that's uh, our segment of pop psychology. So uh, don't take too seriously these interpretations and don't try to interpret somebody's dreams based on what we just looked at. But dreams are common in the scriptures. Not overwhelmingly common, but we have many examples in scriptures. We can go back, well, dreams, for instance, were sometimes used by God to communicate a message or even prophecy. Some, like Daniel, like Joseph, they were gifted in interpreting dreams, and God used them in great ways because of that. And we're going to see the example of Daniel today. But there's an example back in Genesis 20. Abimelech, he you know, was the king of the Philistines at the time of Abraham. And you remember Abraham and, and uh, his whole community was dwelling uh, with the Philistines for a certain time. And Abimelech, he takes Sarah into, basically into his harem. And God gives him a dream that doesn't need to be interpreted. He basically says... Avimelech, you're a dead man. You know, you've taken Abraham's wife uh, in, into your harem. And so uh, Avimelech, he remedies that situation very quickly. There's also the example of Jacob, the grandson of Abraham. And you'll remember uh, Jacob was dwelling with his uncle Laban or Lavan for quite some time, and he was working for him so that he could marry Rachel, whom he loved. And Lavan, it turns out, you know, it wasn't Jacob that was the cheat here. You know, if you read the text carefully, God was with Jacob. God was the one giving Jacob wisdom to deal with Lavan. And so, he, and, and he did this in dreams to Jacob so that he would know how to uh, to use the livestock and even manipulate the, the livestock, but it was really God who miraculously uh, acted on behalf of Jacob in order to deal with Lavan. And we see this in uh, Genesis 31. But I encourage you, if you think Jacob's the villain here, go back and read it carefully, because the text tells us that God was the one who blessed Jacob. God was the one who miraculously helped him to deal with Lavan. But he, he received these things in dreams. Joseph. Joseph, the great-grandson of Abraham, son of Jacob. J uh, Joseph, you know, first of all, he received dreams that his brothers didn't like too much. And his parents even thought, well, you know, this is a little bit over the top because we're all going to be bowing to you, Joseph. So Genesis 37, Genesis 40, Genesis 41, you know, when Joseph was in prison in Egypt, he, re he didn't receive the dreams. He was able to interpret the dreams for a couple of uh, Pharaoh's officials that were in prison with him. And that was a great irony because the Egyptians were known for being able to interpret dreams. In fact, we even have, we have papyrus that dates back almost to the time of Joseph, that's an Egyptian book of dreams, or really dream interpretation. So they prided themselves on being able to interpret dreams. And yet it was Joseph who received the wisdom and the interpretations directly from God. And he was the one who was able to really, uh, really outdo those who, who had spent their whole lives learning to interpret dreams. And we see that uh, in chapter 41 as he goes before Pharaoh. Nobody could interpret the dreams of Pharaoh except for Joseph. Joseph was given the interpretation, and because he received the interpretation, he was able to give advice 
to Pharaoh that not only saved Egypt from the great famine, but also, which, which was seven years, but it also saved the surrounding countries, including the land of Canaan, where Abraham and the entire community was, or not Abraham, but where his father Jacob and the entire community were still dwelling. So God used Joseph in a mighty way, gifting Joseph in being able to interpret dreams. God spoke to King Solomon in a dream. Remember, he, he asked him, ask me for something, you know, and I'll give it to you. And he asked for wisdom, wisdom in order to rule over Israel with godly wisdom. And that's in 1 Kings. In the last days, it says, old men will dream dreams when God pours out his spirit on all flesh. And that originally comes from Joel chapter 2. And this is referred to in Acts chapter 2, that first Shavuot following the resurrection of Yeshua. In Numbers chapter 12, this is when Miriam and Aaron were speaking against Moshe. And God rebukes them and, and says, you know, you're, you're speaking against, against Moshe. I speak to him in a way that's unique, unique throughout the scriptures, because I don't speak to him in a dreams, which is the normal method that God speaks to his prophets, but I speak to him face to face, you know, as, as if conversationally. That's the normal method, but dreams are dreams is, is really the normal method. The exception was Moshe. The rabbinic commentaries, and this is from uh, when it says Babli, that's the Babylonian Talmud. In Brachot 57, it says, it explains that dreams are only one sixtieth the significance of prophecy. So we, so we don't consider them as, as reliable as prophecy themselves, although uh, it, it, the, the rabbinic commentaries also consider dreams to be the buds of prophecy. So oftentimes, you know, again, a, a prophet might dream, and God uses that as an opportunity to provide prophecy uh, through that prophet. And then there's the saying, uh, the, the common saying, this is in the, the Babylonian Talmud as well, dreams lacking interpretation. It's like having letters unread. So, but uh, a little disclaimer, that's not to say that every dream has an interpretation or a useful interpretation or that we have the interpretation to those dreams. But oftentimes, for prophets, God can use those dreams to communicate a message or a prophecy itself. So dreams are important. And now, in Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar, he is given a very disturbing dream. You know, he's, he's very upset about this as he receives this dream. And we'll see what, what it is. But he requires, he calls all of his advisors uh, surrounding him, and, and, and he says, you know, I, I, I have this dream, and I need it interpreted. Seems like a reasonable request for his advisors who are known to have this kind of ability. The problem is that Nebuchadnezzar doesn't trust his advisors. The backstory to this, to really understand why he, doesn't, why he doesn't trust these advisors, is that Nebuchadnezzar is, is new to this position. While he was, while he was attacking Jerusalem, while he was at war uh, in, in Jerusalem, he receives word that his father, who was the king at the time, had died. And that meant that Nebuchadnezzar was now the king. So he's a fairly young person. We don't know exactly how old, but he is now the new king, and he inherits all of these advisors. And if we read the text, which we will uh, in a little bit, we can see that they're magicians, they're um, astrologers, sorcerers, Chaldeans. The term Chaldean, by the way, 
is a generic term for people who lived in the region of Babylon, but it's also a generic term for the advisors, the, the kind of the occultic advisors that now Nebuchadnezzar has inherited to be his advisors. So he doesn't trust them, and he doesn't trust them anymore. How many of you trust psychics? Don't raise your hand, that would be embarrassing. <laughs> or palm readers. You know, I mean, you know, it, it, it actually, we should have a really an adverse reaction to that. You know, it, it's occultic. And so Nebuchadnezzar doesn't seem to trust his advisors any more than we would trust a palm reader or, or psychics. You know, he's very skeptical about their abilities. And by the way, Daniel is eventually put in place over all of these advisors. Well, the king, you know, when I said, I should, I should back it up there, requires advisors to interpret the dream. The one problem is, for the advisors, is that King Nebuchadnezzar, he's not willing to tell them what the dream is. So he wants the interpretation. Interpret my dream, but I'm not telling you what the dream was about. So you're gonna to have to tell me that as well. And the text doesn't really make it clear whether Nebuchadnezzar was forgetful about the dream, you know, whether he didn't quite remember what the dream was about, or that he was testing his advisors. But I think we get the sense as the narrative goes along that he was testing them, that he did remember what the dream was, but he wanted in order for them to prove themselves, any of us, any of us could make something up, right? We hear a dream, somebody tells us a dream that they had, and we can speculate just like we did with the psycho psychologist at the beginning there, Alan Iser. You know, we were speculating on what dreams could possibly mean. Anybody can do that. And if, you're, if you have the abilities like modern psychics and palm readers, you can do it really well and convincingly because they have all kinds of tricks to try to make you believe that they really know what they're talking about. Same with these advisors. And so Nebuchadnezzar says, look, if you're, you know, you're going to give me the interpretation, I want you first to tell me what the dream was about. Then I might consider your interpretation. So the king threatens to execute all of them if they don't, if somebody doesn't come up with the dream and the interpretation. And this becomes a dangerous situation for Daniel as well and for his companions, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They're all in danger here of being executed. So they're in an impossible situation. But what's happening here? It's an impossible situation for Daniel and for his friends. Now, we've been reading this, the scriptures hopefully for many years now, and this is not the first time that a person of faith was put in a very dangerous situation, is it? Why does God do that? Why does he put men and women of faith in such dangerous situations? such difficult and impossible situations. But God is building the faith. He's challenging the faith of Daniel. He's doing it in order to strengthen the faith of Daniel and his companions. And our faith, our faith is built up in the same way. We experience difficulties in our lives, and that's across the board. You can't find one person in this room who has not experienced great difficulty in their life, even after coming to faith in God. It's not a lack of faith to experience difficult situations. It's how we face them. So our faith, like Daniel's, is strengthened in three ways. Not necessarily an exhaustive list, but it's the three that, that we're looking at this morning. We learn to be faithful, and when we, when we say faithful, think of full of faith. Turn it around, full of faith, being faithful. 
And we, we learn to be faithful through each challenge in our lives. And those challenges can come in various forms. It could be financial, it could be illnesses, it could be increased responsibilities that we don't feel that we're prepared for or that we're fearful of. It could be dangerous situations that we find us, ourselves in. But they're all opportunities for us to develop our faith and our faithfulness. A second way, <clears throat> and, and, and these are not mutually exclusive or isolated, but they go together. When we experience God's faithfulness to us, in other words, we face those difficult situations, whether it's financial, whether it's you know, um, in relationships or you know, whatever the situation might be, and then God delivers us or God works out the situation after we've been praying you know, for an answer. And God does, and we come through that challenge. That builds our faith, and we become stronger than we were before we experienced that situation. Same thing is going to happen for uh, Daniel and his, and his companions as well. They're going to increase in their faith and the strength that they have in walking with God. A passage that we should all be familiar with, 1 Corinthians, Paul is addressing the Corinthians here in chapter 10, and he says, God is faithful. He'll not let you be tested beyond what you can bear. But when you are tested, not if you are tested, when you are tested, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Okay? So that's, you know, and, and the more we experience this and the more that we see the Lord working in our lives and working in these difficult situations, the more we trust him and the, and the more ready we are for the even greater challenges. Isn't that encouraging? You just came through, uh, I mean, it is, but on the other hand, you think, well, now I'm ready for something even greater and God's gonna stretch me even more. But that's how it is. You know, God wants us to be strong. The last way is watching and learning from the faithfulness of others. So we're not just isolated in our lives. We're part of a community. We're part of a family. We're part of a, a larger community. And, we, and, and also we have, of course, the examples in Scripture, which are our greatest examples but we watch how God is working in the lives of other people as well, and we, we want to be encouraged by that. So we're, we're watching each other, we're seeing how God works in the lives of each other, and we're praying for one another as well through difficult cir uh, circumstances. But we also are encouraged as we read about these examples in the scriptures. Right now, we're reading through the book of Daniel, and there's much, much encouragement to gain through the narratives. Uh, we're going to see Daniel and the others in, in multiple situations where God's intervention is necessary for their survival. So when faith meets the impossible dream, well, what's the impossible dream? Nebuchadnezzar is the one who made his dream impossible, impossible to interpret, at least without God's help. I hope you're familiar with the song. This was one of my favorites growing up and hearing Andy Williams there uh, singing it. I won't tell you how many decades ago that was, but uh, even before I reached the, the age of eight, I think, I, you know, this was one of my favorite songs. It gave me goosebumps. Look it up if, if, uh, if you haven't heard that before. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. And the dream that he wasn't telling his advisors about. And yet later we're going to see, and, and really in a couple weeks, we're going to see that the dream was something like this image here that we have before us. We have an image of a head of gold, a, uh, a body of you know, shoulders and, and uh, upper body of, of silver, and then a bronze below that, and then iron legs, iron and clay, 
feet and toes. Okay, those represent the iron and, and clay at the very bottom is a division of the iron uh, above that. And what those represent, as we'll see, is it represents Gentile kingdoms, one of them existing at the time of the dream, the, the Babylonian Empire. But these are Gentile kingdoms that dominate the earth and dominate Israel at the same time. So again, we'll, we'll get into that. We'll, we'll touch on it just a little bit today, but we're going to see this over and over and over. And, and actually, there's some parallels between chapters 2 in Daniel and chapter 7 as well. But these, um, these kingdoms, they're really um, at the heart of much of the book of Daniel because of the message. So, we haven't gotten into the text of, of chapter two yet, but a little bit of background uh, just for this chapter in particular. And some of this is, is repeat, but northern, uh, the northern Israel, uh, it was uh, those 10 tribes of northern Israel were exiled by the Assyrians. And this was over 100 years before the siege of Jerusalem in the lower, in the uh, southern uh, kingdom. Uh, so that's already taken place. And just so you get a chronology, because I never can assume, never want to assume that, that everybody likes the history, which you should. You know, if you, if you start to love the scriptures, you're going to start to, to love to put the history together because it's necessary. So, you know, we could go all the way back to, um, uh, you know, to the garden. We could go to the flood with Noah. Um, hundreds of years later, you know, we come to Abraham, you know, with the, the covenant made with him, Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob, all of them were dwelling in the land as sojourners within the promised land, but only as sojourners. And so then, of course, in, in the time of Joseph, they descend into Egypt, the community of Jacob, his father, um, goes down because of this great famine in the, in the land of promise. And then you have Moses, um, who uh, God uses to bring Israel out of Egypt, and then Joshua, who takes them into the land, followed by these judges, and then comes the kings, starting with, just want to make sure you're with me here, starting with King Saul, thank you, Shaul. And so he was the first king, then, then David, and then Solomon, and then the kingdom is divided unfortunately, and it stays that way. So you have the, the southern and the northern tribes of Israel, not evenly divided, by the way. And it's at the end of the time of the kings. First of all, of course, the northern tribe is taken out uh, by the Assyrians, and then it's only the tribe of Judah, the smaller tribe of Benjamin, and, and then some of the Levites who were stationed in the southern portion of Israel. And those are the only ones that, that are in that southern area now. And, now and, and there were many good kings in the southern region, not so much in the north, but in the southern region. And now that's coming to an end. God is ready to exile because of sin, is ready to exile uh, even the southern tribes and that's where Nebuchadnezzar comes in. He attacks Jerusalem around, in fact, it takes place over a number of years. And it results in the captivity and the exile of the southern tribes of Judah. Then, then, if you can picture that, that uh, uh, kind of a statue, that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about representing the four Gentile kingdoms. The context here, you know, the one of the, we can see in Luke chapter 21, Yeshua says um, that the exile, he talks about the exile and the subsequent Gentile rule. So even in the time of Yeshua, this is still the context for the nation of Israel. So he says in uh, Luke 21, he says, Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles or the nations until the times 
of the Gentile be fulfilled. Now notice, it doesn't say time of the Gentiles, it says times of the Gentiles, plural. So he's referring to the fact that when Israel and Judah were exiled, that there were these kingdoms, these, these empires, Gentile empires, which dominated the earth and dominated exiled Israel. And Yeshua is saying, you know, that the end isn't going to happen until after the times of the Gentiles. So that's how important the book of Daniel is in, in terms of understanding Israel's history after the exile. And it gets really exciting at the end of the four kingdoms, by the way, as we'll see. So God, you know, one of the, the messages here that we see in Daniel here is the implicit messages is that God is still ruling even though Israel is exiled. And that exile, it's described in the worst possible terms. Even back in the, in, in the Torah in, in, uh, that uh, Moses communicated to Israel, it was, it was communicated in the worst possible terms. This was the ultimate punishment for Israel to be exiled from the land. And in Hosea, it's, it's, it's described like a, like a divorce. But then he says, you know, where you were low on me, uh, you know, you'll be my people once again. Not my people, and, and then you'll uh, be my people once again. It doesn't mean that Israel ever stopped being God's people, but it's as if that's, that's the intensity of the exile and, and the, the intensity of the punishment that results from it. But then, you know, it makes clear in the Brit Hadashah and of course in the Tanakh as well, that, that Israel, the kingdom, will be restored and established through Israel in Israel, through the Messiah. But you know, I referenced this passage here in Acts 1.6 because it's the final question that the Talmudim, the disciples of Yeshua, ask him before he ascends, after his resurrection, before he ascends to the Lord and to the right hand of, of God. He, they ask him, is it at this time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He doesn't give them a clear answer, by the way. But, but that was the burning question on their minds. So the keys to understanding Sefer Daniel, Sefer meaning book, the book of Daniel. First of all, how is God involved in the world while Israel is exiled and scattered throughout the world? And, and one of the things that it says, uh, you know, that Moses communicated to them, if you get to the point where you're exiled from the land, you're going to be forced to serve the false gods of the nations to which you're sent. So it's, it's a terrible kind of a situation. But, but how is God involved in the world while Israel is exiled and scattered throughout the world? This is, one of the, this is one of those concerns that's addressed in Daniel. Will the kingdom of God return to Israel? It's answered in, in actually in Daniel chapter 2, although we won't get to that for a couple of weeks. When will it happen? We don't really know, but we have an idea of the chronology. And when the kingdom is restored to Israel, it will be through the Messiah. And we can look at Daniel as this culmination of this time of exile, this time of subjugation to the four major empires of the world, culminating in the Messianic kingdom. And that's all part of this dream, this impossible dream of Nebuchadnezzar, including the Messianic kingdom. And that's, the, that's really the underlying focus within the book of Daniel. So last week in Daniel 1, you know, we saw the exile of the teenagers, Daniel and his three companions. That's uh, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And, uh, I, and just for the Hebrew students here, 
good to know how to pronounce their names in Hebrew. Daniel, Hananiah, Yishael, and Azariah. Of course, it says Va-Azariah, which means and Azariah. And then Daniel chapter 1, of course, we have the miracle of the kosher food. Right? They didn't want to defile themselves with the food from the king's table, and so they, you know, they asked for a test. You know, just test us out. Let us eat you know, just the, the vegetables and, and not eat from the, the table of the king and see if we look as healthy as the others. And, of course, they looked even healthier. So uh, it was, again, you know, God, it, it, this was one of those miracles that, that uh, got things started for them in Babylon. So let's go to the text here. The text in Daniel chapter 2, verse 1. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams. His spirit was troubled, and sleep escaped him. So the king issued an order to summon the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans in order to explain to the king his dreams. Again, these are the advisors who he has inherited. And, he, and, and you get the impression that he views them the same way we would view the psychics, you know, the phonies. When they came and stood before the king, he said to them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit is anxious to understand the dream. You know, he felt like this isn't just an ordinary dream. This is something that I really need to have interpreted and to understand. And in verse 4, then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic. Now, this is the, one of the fascinating, fascinating things about the book of Daniel, is that from this point forward, all the way through chapter 7 in the book of Daniel, it's written in Aramaic now. You know, something very unique in the scriptures. But keep in mind, they're in, they're in exile, and now this is the, the language of exile, here and so from this point forward, this is this is uh, chapter two, verse four, all the way through the end of chapter seven. It the 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 book of Daniel is now written in Aramaic. It will resume back to Hebrew uh, in chapter eight. But again, at this point, the focus in the book of Daniel is going to be on those Gentile kingdoms those dominating Gentile empires. In the context of Israel being in exile, because they're going to dominate the Jewish people who are scattered throughout the nations at this time. They're going to dominate. And even when some of the people come back after 70 years, some of the Jewish people come back to the land. At the time of Yeshua, there were, there were many Jewish people living in the land. Most were living outside of the land. But even during the time of Yeshua, the Jewish people were dominated by the Roman Empire, one of the empires that's, that's talked about in the book of Daniel. So all of these chapters are now focused on those kingdoms. So then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic. May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will declare the interpretation. The king answered the Chaldeans saying, I firmly decree, if you do not make the dream and its meaning known to me, you will be torn limb from limb and your houses reduced to rubble. But if you tell me the dream and its meaning, both, you have to tell me both, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and its meaning. They responded a second time saying, let the king tell his servants the dream. Tell us the dream first, and we will declare the interpretation. Now, any of us can do that. We just can't do it with the same deceptiveness and, uh, and, and, and probably not as convincing as they could have done it, but we could all speculate on what the dream might have meant. 
So Nebuchadnezzar is not convinced that they're really on the level here. So let the king tell his servants the dream and we will declare the interpretation. And the king replied saying, I know for sure that you are buying time since you see that I have firmly decreed that, that if you do not reveal the dream to me, there is only one verdict or law for you. I'll know that you have conspired to say something false and fraudulent until such a time as things might change. So then, tell me the dream, and I will know that you can tell me its meaning. So we have a kind of a stalemate here, except that, of course, the king has the upper hand. They are in big trouble if they cannot come up with, the, with the, both the dream and the interpretation. So in verse 10, the Chaldeans answered the king, saying, There is no man on earth who can meet the king's demand, for no great king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing from any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. This is unheard of. You're making a totally unreasonable request and demand of us. We can't possibly do it. There's no person on earth that can do this. Now, my mind, how many of you have seen the, the movie Chariots of Fire? I love that movie. Even though they, you know, the, the main character whom I love, Eric Little, uh, you know, he got the, the wrong day for the Sabbath, but, you know, we'll put that aside. I still love the movie. I absolutely love the movie. And, um, and it's interesting because there were two Olympic runners uh, that the movie focuses on, Harold Abraham, who was Jewish, uh, and, and then Eric Little, uh, who was, um, he wasn't Irish, he was, thank you, he was Scottish. And so at one point in the movie, you know, Harold Abrams, you know, he was, he was uh, a known runner, he was, he was very famous, and, uh, and, and one of the, <laughs> he's asked at one point, you know, how do you feel when you lose a race? And he says, I don't know, I've never lost one. You know, and so, so um, at one point, you know, they show him running a race, he, he wins the race, and somebody makes the comment, uh, you know, there couldn't possibly be a faster man in the kingdom, the kingdom of England, of course. And then immediately, that's a transition over to Eric Little, you know, and they show him, uh, you know, the, the movie starts focusing on him a bit. And so, you know, there's no, there couldn't possibly be a faster man in the kingdom, and then that focuses on Eric Little. Well, Eric Little, um, he, he actually beat um, Abrahams twice, you know, two out of two times. Uh, it only shows one time in the movie, uh, but beat him in the 100-meter in the dash. Uh, he beat Harold Abrams. Um, so, so there was a faster man in the kingdom. That, that, that was the, the point there. Um, but it turns out in the movie, of course, uh, Eric Little wouldn't run on the Sunday, and so Eric, uh, so Harold Abrams, um, he's the only representative of England running in the in the hundred meter dash. He wins the gold medal, and then Eric Little wins the uh, the four hundred meter, and that's that's the movie. So I encourage you to go see the movie. All this to say that there was this there was this transition. There's there couldn't be possibly be a greater runner in the kingdom, and here we have an ironic statement here in verse 10, it says, there is no man on earth who can meet the king's demand. But then of course the narrative switches over to Daniel, because Daniel is able to, uh, to do this, not on his own accord, not because of his own wisdom, not because of his great ability to interpret dreams, although he did have that, that ability, but because God gives him the dream, he tells him what the dream is, and he tells Daniel what it means. And the interesting thing, we'll see this as uh, uh, in a couple weeks actually, when Daniel finally does go in be to, uh, before the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, he makes it absolutely clear that this is not by my wisdom. He wants Nebuchadnezzar to know it's the God in heaven, it's our God in heaven, the God of Israel, who is able to, in, to give the dream, to let the dream be known, and its interpretation. He wants Nebuchadnezzar to know 
that there is only one God in heaven, one creator, and he gives absolute glory to God and not to himself. Verse 11, what the king asks is too difficult. There is no one uh, who could declare to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with mortals. So their idea of the gods is that they are, they are removed. They're removed from the realm of the mortals. And yet we see throughout the scriptures, including, of course, Yeshua, the word of God, who tabernacles in flesh and, and dwelt among us. But even before that, God's dwelling you know, it was with man. That was the whole purpose of the Shekinah, the, the glory of God dwelling at the tabernacle, dwelling at the temple, is that God's presence, he wants to dwell amongst us. He wants to dwell amongst uh, the people of Israel. He wants to dwell in any community where we worship God, including here, including today. Our God does not, he does dwell amongst the mortals who worship him and honor him. Verse 12, because of this, the king became furiously angry and gave orders to execute all the wise men of Babylon. So the decrees went out that the wise men were about to be slaughtered. They also sought Daniel and his companions to execute them. We have a cliffhanger, don't we? My allotted portion today was through verse 13. <laughs> I cannot go beyond it. Well, I can give you a little preview anyway. So the next two weeks, Daniel consults with the captain of the king's guard. His name is Arioch. Why are we slated to be executed? Daniel didn't know anything about what was going on. You know, Daniel and his companions were, were at a fairly low level now within the administration. So Daniel did, did, really didn't know what was going on, but he consults with the captain of the king's guard. Eventually, you know, he's given permission by the, the uh, captain of the guard to go in before the king. So he asks the king for more time. Daniel goes in before King Nebuchadnezzar, this low-ranking administrative official, goes in before the king and, he's, and, he, and he asks, he requests more time. If you give me a little bit more time, I will give you the dream and its interpretation. So Daniel, after he's granted that extension, he goes back to his friends. Together they seek God. Then Daniel receives the answer in a dream, and he gives praise to God for his goodness and his greatness, and that's going to be uh, 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 next week's message, which is wonderful. Um, uh, there's, there's so much there. And then two weeks from now, Daniel returns. He's received the answer. He's been, he's, he gives praise to God for the answer, and Daniel returns to Ariel, who takes Daniel before the king. Daniel makes sure that Nebuchadnezzar understands that the answer didn't come from him, but instead he gives glory to God. God is the one who revealed this. God is the only one who could reveal this to King Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel, of course, describes the king's dream and its meaning. And what's described there, you get a little preview here because, again, you're going to hear this over and over as we go through the book of Daniel, that it deals with four Gentile kingdoms that dominate the world and dominates the Jewish people who are in exile. And this happens until the time of Messiah, the reign of Messiah. Those kingdoms, Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, and then the Messianic kingdom. But the four, you know, most of the time people talk about the four kingdoms, that are in this dream. So here we have again that, that image representing four Gentile kingdoms. Now, I just gave you the kingdoms, so what's the first one? It's the Babylonian kingdom. Of course, that's the kingdom that Daniel is, is now dealing with. Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. What's the second one? I'm not going to put it up here. You just 
it's the Medo-Persian Empire, which comes right after that. Uh, the Medo-Persian, it's, it's really two kingdoms combined. One has King Darius, the other one has King Cyrus. And, uh, and we'll see that. Daniel actually lives to see that, and he becomes important in that kingdom as well. Oops, I don't want to go past that yet. So the third one, it's the Greek Empire, starting with Alexander the Great, and then it breaks into four empires, uh, or, or four sections of the Greek Empire, including the Seleucids and the, the Ptolema uh, Ptolemaic uh, uh, areas in Egypt. The Seleucids are on the other side of Israel, and Israel's right in between two of them. The Seleucids, the, the, the king that we know the best of the Seleucids is who? Antiochus Epiphanes, right. And of course, uh, you know, we have the, uh, the Maccabean revolt against them. But that's the Greek Empire. The fourth one is what? It's Rome, right. And then the iron and clay, that's, um, that's the uh, Rome, kind of Rome divided there as well. So we're really dealing with four kingdoms. But the fifth kingdom, you know, nobody talks about that when they're, when they're talking about the, the, the book of Daniel. But it's there, it's just as, just as present as the other four. The fifth kingdom is not a Gentile kingdom, but rather, let's say it the way it is, it's a Messianic Jewish kingdom that lasts how long? And this is a trick question. Wow, you guys are good. You know, see, you expect people to say, well, it lasts a thousand years. The Messianic kingdom, it lasts a thousand years. But see, at the end of the thousand years, there, the scriptures de describe a kind of a revolt against, against uh, uh, the kingdom and against Messiah, but then that's put down rather quickly. So there's really no break in this kingdom. It, and, and in Daniel, it makes it very clear. This kingdom, it destroys the other kingdoms and it lasts forever. So that's the Messianic Jewish kingdom. That's exciting, right? It gives you goosebumps. So when faith meets the impossible dream, it's going to be continued, chapter two. But I, you know, I encourage you though, you know, just as I mentioned, we, our faith is built up as we see the faith and the faithfulness of others. The book of Daniel is so inspiring, and I encourage you, as we're going along in these studies, read every week. You know, chapter, we're going to be in chapter two for a couple weeks here, a couple more weeks. You know, read that especially, but, but read the whole book and read it more than once, you know, and, and let it encourage your hearts because the, it's, you know, you should get goosebumps every time you read through uh, Dan, Daniel. Let's, uh, let's stand together and we'll close in prayer. And the worship team. Our Father in heaven, Avinu Shabbat Shemaim. Lord, we pray that your kingdom will come soon and in our day. That Yeshua, our Messiah, will come quickly to establish his kingdom that will last for eternity. And as we read and study the book of Daniel, may we be inspired and may we be transformed in our own faith and faithfulness, learning from the example of Daniel, who did not fear, showed no fear at this great challenge here in chapter two. The example of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. May we be strengthened to press on, to face the challenges in our own lives with the same confidence and fearlessness of Daniel. And we pray this, you know, and, and have confidence in you through the transformational power of your Holy Spirit, Bashem Yeshua. Amen.